Welcome everybody to the second edition of the Executive Insights webinar series by MediaCorp. Today we're going to be talking about the future of brand safety and it's a very hot topic right now. My name is Jennifer Chase, I'm the VP of Digital Sales and Solutions. Today I'm joined by Jamie Hose, Chief Editor of CNA Digital, Amy McDonough, our Ad Tech Specialist from MediaCorp, Trang Dang, Publisher Development Lead for Oracle Data Cloud, and Pierre E, our Programmatic Director for MediaCorp. Before we get started, just a couple of housekeeping things. Um, down the bottom, there is a Q&A area, so please do make sure that you ask your questions because we will be answering questions at the end of the session. Okay. So brand safety has always been there, but it really took centre stage in 2017. It became the dominant topic in the digital ad world, where industry leaders were paranoid about the possibility of their ads appearing adjacent to terrorist recruitment videos or pornography. More advertisers turned to extensive block lists to protect their ads, and quite rightly. The use of block lists led to considerable amounts of content being blocked. That's both unsafe content as well as safe content. So before we get started, we want to know where everyone is at when it comes to your own brand safety solution. So if you could take a couple of seconds to complete this poll. Great. Thanks everyone for completing that poll. So there's a real mix of feedback here. Either people are at the legacy stage of brand safety, some um, are at the baseline stage, there are some, which is great news, that have moved towards brand suitability. And it's great to actually see that 2% of us are actually at the stage of contextual intelligence. So today we're going to explain this in more detail for you in terms of you know, how we can move you to brand suitability and onwards. So we're going to run through this today. How can we, how to make sure you guys stay brand safe? Um, first of all, we're going to take, talk about con shifting consumer sentiment in regards to COVID-19. We're going to explain the difference between the difference between brand suitability and brand safety. And then we're going to take a deep dive in brand suitability and how that relates to COVID-19. We're then going to take the news perspective, and that's where Jamie from CNA uh, will be talking to him in more detail. And then we're going to give you a look at the proactive approach we take to keeping your brand safe on our news platforms. And there's always limitations around brand safety, so we're also going to talk about that today. And then finally, what's next for brands, which is really important. So I want to start at the heart of this, which is the brand. Think of why you buy those different types of clothes, why you eat the cereal. You may not realise it, but you're influenced by the brand. Why do you choose certain products over others? It all boils down to how well that brand keeps its promise. A good brand is a promise, but a great brand is a promise kept. So when it comes to keeping the promise to the consumers, it's no wonder in the digital world people are really nervous. Um, and in some cases, very risk adverse. In the past few years, as you saw up front, there have been very big global stories where brands have been found themselves against very questionable content. Um, and it did cause some damage to their brands. So keeping a brand safe and ensuring it reaches the right audiences in the right context is certainly top of mind for brands, particularly in the current pandemic. So let's talk about what's happening today. COVID has completely changed consumer sentiments. This is research from Nielsen. 
71% of people will lose brand trust if a brand is seen to be putting profit over people. 84% of people want brands to focus within their messaging on how they can help people through the pandemic. They're also looking for a reliable news source. 65% said that the brand's response in the crisis will actually have a huge impact on how they purchase the products of that brand in the future. And then 55% value actions of brands over media and government. So don't just talk, show us that you're doing something. According to a recent IOB study, 63% of advertisers are also adjusting their messages. There's been a 41% increase in calls related marketing. Here is a great example from Nike. If you ever dreamed of playing for millions around the world, now is your chance. Play inside, play for the world. Now let's understand how these things come together. Brand safety and brand suitability. With today's more advanced contextual technologies, there are more elegant alternatives available to just blacklisting. So the conversation really has evolved from brand safety to brand suitability. But before we do anything else, let's go ahead and understand the definition of each of these. Brand safety, it's any risk in the digital supply chain, be it financial, like fraud, legal, data privacy, reputational risk, which is your ad adjacent to the wrong content, and that's better known as negative ad adjacency. Brand safety is all about exclusion. It's an outdated term that typically refers to a blanket approach of blocking content through the use of keywords, but it's certainly a very reactive and a defensive approach to brand safety. So if you're still in this mode, which I could see from the research up front, there were a few people here, you actually need to start thinking about brand suitability because brand suitability goes a lot further, sorry, brand suitability is all about going much further than content exclusion. It's about going much further than that fear-based content avoidance, but it's about inclusion, identifying and targeting the relevant content that works for you and your brand. So if you put it in simple terms, it's placing an ad against the most contextually relevant content to drive better outcomes for the brand. It's also about leveraging quality sites that are aligned with your brand objectives and your brand values. So it's, it's a really proactive and a positive approach. It's better known in some cases as brand safety 2.0. So this is what the defensive solution achieved, the brand safety defensive solution. It avoided really embarrassing situations like this. And this is a story about Mercedes-Benz, the risk of catching fire. And here you see there's a Mercedes-Benz ad targeted to the content. So this is what we would call negative ad adjacency. And certainly would have an adverse effect, effect even on the brand. This is also something that brand suitability can achieve because it achieves exclusion. But it takes it a step further because brand suitability is also about inclusion because it's driving more relevance. Here is a great example. This is a story on CNA Lifestyle. It's about Hari Raya and Circuit Breaker and how do you make a great inside in lockdown. And here is an ad for Burger King promoting their Ramadan delivery um, throughout this period. And this is a perfect example, example even of how this can drive relevancy. Here's another example. And this is a great example about how this goes way beyond content avoidance and it's making sure your message is aligned with positive articles, in this case, around COVID-19. This particular article is targeted at someone like me, I'm a parent, and it talks about what are all the cool online activities you can do with your kids during lockdown. So as you can see through this article, very positive, um, and in the middle of this article, there is an ad promoting children's nutrition, again, targeted at myself. So this is not only driving relevancy, but it's also driving a better outcome. And it's a really good example of why positive targeting around COVID-19 is really important. So now let's put this into action for you. I'm gonna give you an example of how brand suitability works. So let's take the word shot. In your minds, how many different scenarios can you think when you use the word shot? Is it one? It could be three, maybe five. Let's give it a go. Firearms. Sports, photography, healthcare, and then negative, alcohol, ambition, broken, death and injury. So now I'm gonna give you some more context around this. 
Here is a positive story on our site within the sports section on CNA. It's about a British shot put champion who obviously can't do his competition outside, so he's going to go into a virtual shot put showdown. But a very positive story. The next story is about funding for the COVID-19 vaccine, and I would say very applicable for different sectors. This story is about Singapore being a long shot for the World Cup 2034, but I would love to see that happen. Here is a story about Tom Cruise on our CNA Lifestyle side, aiming higher in his feature film, feature film even, to be shot on a space station. And here's your negative story. COVID-19 researcher shot dead in US murder suicide. And this gives you a very good example why doing a blanket approach for COVID-19 doesn't work. Because if you did that blanket exclusion approach, you cut out all of that positive content and you miss seeing that audience. So now I'm going to hand over to Trang, who is from Oracle Data Cloud. She is going to go into a deep dive around brand suitability. Over to you, Trang. Thank you, Jenny. Good morning, everyone. So now as you become more and more sophisticated in your approach, uh, this is how you should be thinking about contextual targeting. So there are four levels of sophistication. The first level, we call it legacy protection. And they comprise of domain and keyword blacklisting and whitelisting. Uh, this is an outdated method that we do not recommend anymore. So instead of this, we recommend everyone to move towards the baseline protection. This level two is adequate with the use of pre-bit protection of brand safety, viewability, ad uh, and ad fraud bot traffic. So with baseline protection, you will ensure that your ad is served to human and is viewable and is served on the brand safe environment. And as we move towards brand suitability, we will now go deeper into customizing of strategy for targeting and curated um, contextual audience segment. At the highest level, Brands should be proactively reaching out to their audience through multi-contextual targeting and AI predictive segment. So I would like you to take a minute to think about where you see your brands and agency on the path. So uh, go back to the poll um, uh, at the beginning of the, of, of the session, about 23% of us are still around queue blacklisting, legacy, uh, legacy protection, and only 23% has moved to baseline protection. So maybe consider the change. If you have any question, feel free to send um, your question in to us now so we can uh, get to them in the end of the session. And now we agree that brands need a smarter engine, a deeper understanding of what the content really is. Contextual intelligence is a capability that does not rely on tracking cookies or any other personally identifiable information. So this information is solely deployed to create a, an understanding of the content of the page and will report back to the buyer on the categories of the content so that brands and agency and publisher can make a deliberate decision about where they're placing the ads. This technology works today without any dependency on cookies or any other user ID. In this way, contextual intelligence is future-proof in terms of reliance on the cookies. So let's look at an, an example a bit closer to home. Apple, right, is the word that we use fairly often. So like short, the example that Jenny just shown, Apple can be used in different circumstances. In this article, it is about apple cider vinegar and the matching contextual segment correctly identify food-related content. In the next example, Apple is used in a different context totally and the matching contextual segment also identify correctly as tech, computing and smartphone. So imagine that if you want to target Apple, be it if you have a, a, a drink brand like um, Apple Juice, or if you want to advertise for, for Apple and you target the keyword Apple, imagine your, your phone appear next to a drink content. That's not good. Right, so flawed solutions harms more than help. At this point, you might wonder what set aside contextual intelligence with the traditional keyword blocking based technology. So in the example here, the keyword like cancer and ambush are likely included under death and injury keyword blacklist. So exact match keyword blocking, when, when that is used, this article, the first one, will be marked as unsafe and not suitable for advertising. So that is a missed opportunity. With the true contextual intelligence solution, it first identifies the language of the article, not the language of, of the browser. 
um, their taxonomy built over uh, 31 languages or, uh, globally and no machine translate is used. The software will then scan the whole content of the page and pick up keywords that are uh, based on their sig significant meaning. And these keywords are then matched back with the pre-built taxonomy and the segment is returned in the ranking of relevance. So the keyword ambush in this case does not mean a violent action. Together with other keyword in this article, it means uh, about, it makes up the content about woman fashion. So this page is now correctly marked as safe advertising. So the solution is fully customizable for customers to build their own contextual strategy in multiple languages and in multiple assets. And we all know languages are dynamic and are used in many different ways, right? So this is why keyword blacklist will miss the mark by a lot. So you, if, you have, if you have done this before, maybe you know what I'm talking about. We often receive requests to apply a huge blacklist of thousands of keywords, and it's impossible to fill any ad with those requirements. And using blind blacklist, 60% of those content is marked as unsafe, while using contextual intelligence, only 27% is marked unsafe, and it's freeing 33% of inventory available for advertising. And this is a lot of money that can be used toward delivering new campaigns and reaching out to new target audience. This is not a new problem exclusive to coronavirus content. So page level understanding is the key. So you know one of the two friends who just read the, the title and jump into conclusion or immediately comment without understanding anything at all. So same thing can be, have, can be applied to machine. If URL is not the best re representation of the articles, so if technology only read the URL, we will see a lot of cases like this when the URL is safe but the content is not safe and vice versa. So if your technology provider insists to stick with keyword blacklist, domain, black or whitelisting, it could be that their technology has not been developed to accommodate this need for brand suitability. So as a leading technology provider in this space who has been doing this for years, crawling over trillions of articles, this is our responsibility to urge you to consider moving away from legacy protection by using keyword blacklist. And please understand that page level analysis is a must and on the path to brand suitability, we need customization and contextual insight. So brand suitability is about eliminating fear and gaining the real control back. So now I will pass the time to Jenny and Jamie to deep dive into the importance of journalism. Thank you, Trang. So did you know 35% of all coronavirus mentions appearing on pages are actually considered brand safe, but often there's a 100% block, so they're being shunned by advertisers. Here's what's happening on our own news platforms. We've had a 342% growth on our news platforms. Monthly, that, that translates into 326 million monthly page views on monthly, which is huge. And then 269% growth in unique visitors. And that's both local as well as international and regional. So the question is, if you're doing blanket blocks and you see all of these audiences coming to the platform, are you actually missing an opportunity? Here is some great research that was done by Edelman. It's called the Edelman Trust Barometer, done in March 2020. It's a special report focused around trust in the coronavirus. In this question, they asked, you know, what are the platforms people look for when they're looking for trustworthy information around, around the virus and keeping themselves updated? Major news organisations came out on top at 64%. This was followed by national government sources at 40%. And then a far distant third was social media at 38%. So this does really put into question, you know, where all the budgets are going and why so much is going towards social. So now let's talk about why journalism matters during these times. Again, data from the Trust Barometer. Seven in 10 people are following the Corona news daily. 74% are worried about fake news being spread and misinformation being spread around the virus. 45% find it difficult to find reliable and trustworthy information around the virus and its effects. So now let's talk about something that happened quite recently. This is a global issue. There's been a lot of media around the level of blocking, new, blocking content, I should say, on news sites. 
This is a case where it really sums up why we should be moving more towards brand suitability versus brand safety methods. As we're all familiar with, this is the New York Times. It's the homepage of the New York Times. And obviously, you know, they're a very reputable, trust, trustworthy platform, very credible. When you see an ad like this with clouds, it actually means the ad has been blocked by the tech that's being used. So it never gets to the publisher. And you really should, could be reducing your ability to reach quality audiences through your own keyword blocking strategies. So now at this point, I would like to welcome Jamie Ho. He's our Chief Editor of CNA Digital. Welcome, Jamie. Hi, welcome everyone. Good morning. Hi. Jamie, you're a very busy man, so thanks for your time. Before we get started, let's, let's talk about what life has been like on the news floor in the last couple of months. Um, well, it's been crazy to say the least. Um, as you saw, there's been a huge surge in traffic. People are sort of flocking to uh, the safety of our brand, if I may say so. Uh, and we are trying to keep up both in terms of the volume of the stories that we put out and the quality of the stories that we put out. And, you know, to be frank, all this uh, in a situation where we are entirely working from home, which is uh, entirely new to us, the entire team is off. Um, it's been a useful learning experience. It's uh, put in new learning processes and work processes, but we are getting by. Great. So, Jamie, first, I think it'd be great to understand for us, what does CNA, the brand itself, stand for? You know, what is our own approach in protecting the CNA brand? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a good point. I think not many people uh, also think of us as a brand. Um, people would usually think of us as a news platform and somehow other different from, from what people think of in terms of brands. And I wanted to give you guys all, I suppose, a really bigger picture sense of how we see ourselves as that, as you were saying, uh, Jenny, and how we protect it. So, you know, at, at the core of it, what we provide is, is information, uh, news. And, you know, other brands that sell something usually have a supply chain that and sort of enables them to produce what it is that they do, right? It could be physical, it could be nuts and bolts, but it could also be something intangible like intellectual property and expertise. And the way I see it personally is that the primary basis on which uh, we provide that information and use falls down to trust and credibility. So credibility is really something that needs to be developed uh, built upon cultivated 24 7 and when times of crisis hit like now with COVID-19 uh, this is when we see how important credibility is um, as I said there is a flight to safety and credibility mm -hmm. but more importantly actually now is, is, is we take it even more seriously we, we take even greater care in how we manage our credibility and then mm -hmm. everyone knows you know credibility is hard won uh, but very easily lost. So the question is how we build it up. Uh, and for digital, you know, it's every story, every angle, every headline, every sentence, and frankly, everything that appears to our audience on our page and our social platforms. And, you know, since we're talking about ads, it would include ads as well. Yeah. So, Jamie, I mean, obviously, we're producing a lot of content around COVID-19. Um, Talk to us about, I guess, the role that CNA is playing, and I'd love to get a better idea of the diversity of the content that we're producing around this topic as well. Yeah, I mean, um, if we maybe start from the beginning in the early sort of uh, months when COVID first um, kind of exploded here in Singapore, when, when cases weren't that many, but when you first started getting your imported cases uh, and your first community cases, and there was just so much information out there but very few people were able to put it all together in a way that made sense to the audience. So what we did in those early days, for example, and this is just one example, is really try to break down all the information into easily digested formats. And one of these ways was uh, infographics and breaking down all the clusters. So there were many early clusters, for example, and news was coming out on a daily uh, basis on additions to that cluster, this person being linked to another person in another cluster. And it was also confusing. And I think CNA, we, we decided within the newsroom to really up our own um, capabilities in visually describing it because there's, there's only so much sometimes that words can do. So it's always about uh, being creative, being innovative in, in the kind of information that we're getting. And it's still uh, something that we carry through to today. Yeah. 
Jamie, I mean, I know we've spoken a bit about COVID-19, but I think we should also touch on, I mean, obviously there is um, terrible tragedies that sometimes occur. You mm -hmm. know, that's a terrorist attack or an airline crash. You know, talk a bit about the approach that we take with brands and our collaboration, I guess, between editorial and ad tech. Um, yeah, I mean, when, when depending upon um, the situation at hand, whether it is, as you say, a terrorist attack or a natural disaster, mm -hmm. uh, we do have quite uh, close links with our colleagues uh, on your front. And, and we will say, hey, by the way this has happened, I'm sure you know, um, keep us in the loop uh, as far as you can on, on what's being planned, what may be out there, and, and let's have a discussion on what may be suitable, what may not at this particular point in time. Because if it's, a, if it's an airline disaster, we need to keep an extra eye on something. If it's a um, terrorist attack in a popular spot, you know, in, in Paris, in London, or wherever it may be, we also need to have another think about that. If it's a mass poisoning event in another country, we also have to think about what goes on the website. And it's an iterative process, I suppose. It's never going to be perfect, but I think we've got good enough lines of communication between us that we can sort of uh, talk it through. Yeah, yeah. Um, Jamie, um, a big thank you for your time today because I know you're so busy. Um, for every no audience, um, Jamie's going to be around at the end to answer any questions you have. So please do make sure you ask those questions in the question box. But thanks, Jamie, for your time. No worries. Amy, I would like to introduce Amy McDonough now, who is now going to take you through more of the proactive approach that we're taking to keep your brand site safe on the news platforms. Over to you, Amy. Thank you, Jenny. A comprehensive brand safety strategy starts by addressing some of the content that Jamie just mentioned that is not suitable for any advertising with always on 100% blocking at the article level. New sites protect brands by blocking advertising from unsafe topics such as violent crime, terrorism and tragedy. If you're buying outside of professionally edited news sites, the li this list will need to be tailored to that environment. In addition to predicting the keywords that will flag this content, blocking lists should be constantly monitored and adjusted. As Jamie mentioned, this requires a strong collaboration between ad editorial and ad tech to keep up with the breaking news. The second tier is where you consider issues relevant to your brand and industry. What reflects negatively on your brand might be obvious, like safety in the airline industry. Other topics might require a deeper understanding, like how your sustainability record is perceived. An article about banning plastic could provide a positive or a negative context, depending on your brand and industry. The third tier, oh sorry, um, custom blocking segments that are bespoke for your brand, industry and risk tolerance will address any topics that detract from your message. The third tier is brand suitability. Placing ads against quality content that is contextually relevant to drive outcomes. In this example, the content highlights the importance of the message, giving urgency to the takeaway of rethinking investment strategy in the current crisis. It shows how COVID coverage can be unlocked to provide a powerful context for relevant brands. Quality content is the first element of brand suitability. Research has shown that the same ad seen adjacent to quality content is seen as 74% more likable. Contextual segments are used to target your brand to relevant complementary content. These can be based on standard segments that are already created, tailored for individual campaigns, or we can work with Trung and her team to suggest AI predictive segments to take the campaign to the next level of technical sophistication. Data can be used where it is relevant to the message. For instance, time of day can be used to show breakfast food in the morning, or weather could be used to, show, to advertise ride sharing in the rain. First party audience data can also be used to target the audience segments most relevant to your brand, as Jenny described before with the um, infant formula example for parents. I hope this has inspired you to formulate a brand suitability strategy if you don't already have one. Reach out if you need any help along the way. I'll now hand over to Pierre who will talk about brand safety limitations. 
Hi everyone, uh, we covered quite a lot already, but what I want to show to you uh, is now that we you know what brand safety, brand suitability is, what the tools are, there are some technology limitations right now. So I want to go with you for two examples and tell you how we should navigate through it as well. So the first one is for the homepage buyout. And that's something that uh, we see quite a lot and it's super great tool for something like great, uh, for the launch of your product, the launch of a promotion offering like you see uh, in the bottom for, for a brand that had uh, great promotions. And the, it could be as well for, let's say on the 4th of June when there is no post, uh, confinement anymore and you want to shout to Singaporeans, hey, we're back to business, happy to see you again. It should be great. Now, the, the challenge that we have is that brand safety technology cannot, measure, cannot be measured on the homepage, unlike the articles. So what you should think about when you decide to have a homepage buyout is you need to accept some level of risk because anything could happen. At the same time, uh, even if you have some level of risk, I want you to, to tell you that uh, you are still in control because in case of anything happens, let's say uh, a scandal happens to something for your, in your industry, there is a crash, etc. we can just post the campaign immediately. So you are in control of your brand. The second example I want to show you to talk about is more uh, to, to tapping into an opportunity now, which is the video. And video now, as you might see, uh, even in your, in your household with your friend, your family, uh, everyone is consuming much, much more content. And actually we see a, a double growth uh, of consumption of, of video content across markets. Uh, but when it comes to brand safety technology, it is still at early stage. And uh, if you see uh, on the screen, I, there's, the first one is that only a portion of the screens can be measured. So only 28% of that. Why is because on desktop, you can, be, you can measure everything and it's based on a technology I will talk about later, which is on Synopsys. On the mobile, it is uh, possible on mobile web, but not on the mobile apps. And think about it, everyone, when you watch your video content on your phone, whether it's Netflix, View, uh, MiWatch, et cetera, you are using an app. This is where the audience is. And when it comes to the CTV, the big screen that you have at home, it is not available now. Okay, so yeah, you might think that's, that's a big challenge, but actually there was a way to navigate around it. This way is you use desktop as a proxy to have a score, and then you just use this proxy to adapt to the other screens, mobile and CTV, so that you can optimize the reach of your campaign. The second example and, uh, that's when you, you might uh, face as well when, you come to, when it comes to video content is there the methodology is based on keywords and is very uh, critical for our context in Singapore with the Asian drama because technology is based on the synapses but not on the content. And I took you here, you can see three type of content that we have now on MeWatch and they are the top three uh, titles that we have right now. But each of them in the synopsis, they have something that uh, might lead to a very uh, low uh, unsafe score because there are keywords like dying, death and accident. Why is it so? It's because all the content here, whether it's Korean, Chinese, etc., it all starts with a very, very sad uh, moment. Like let's say you have a Korean girl whose father just died in an accident, etc. But the rest of the story is super entertaining, can be a love story, etc but your technology will show it is not safe, okay? But we can navigate about it. So if you can just click on the next. So we, uh, so we had a case study actually, it was a great example, and it was for uh, a video campaign on the airline. And I love this example. Uh, so what we decided at the early stage when we talked with the agency, we say, okay, this is for airline, it's quite sensitive, so we decided to put away the news channel and focus only on the entertainment genre, okay, the dramas. Methodology, the methodology that we used was the keywords uh, based on synopsis. But initially, uh, after one week, uh, the agency came back to us and said, hang on, you have uh, 10 to 20% of your content is absolutely unsafe. It's flagged for injury, death, crime, accident, uh, violence, uh, 
what can we do about it? And I love this example because it is an agency coming to us and we have that discussion. It is super critical because we can address that. So how did we do it uh, when they came to us? Uh, we took all the shows that was airing at that time on MeWatch and we gave the synopsis back to it and they came back to their clients to talk through, through the, the widest of these contents and they selected some of them or all of them. So that's why you can actually be in control of your brand safety or brand suitability during your campaign. It can be even at the early stage of your campaign where you want to select for the brand suitability, maybe some different kind of content that you want to be on, on it, okay? So just to summarize the best practice when it comes to OTT, number one is super important. You define a strategy across all the screens, not only one. Second, you will use the desktop as a measurement and use the score as a proxy for the other screen so that you have a complete rich optimization. Then like for the example I had for the airline, be upfront with us regarding your brand safety requirements, what you want to do before the campaign is even better. And during the campaign, if you have a score that it looks unsafe, come back to us and we can navigate around it, we can fix it. And finally, the whitelisting of shows is absolutely possible. And that's actually what you should consider for your campaign. So now we have covered quite uh, a lot of content right now uh, from brand safety and suitability, the perspective from uh, a news editor as well, all our proactive approach on news, the limitation of the technology. So it's time to wrap up uh, our session and we'll lead it to Jennifer. Thank you, Pierre. So ultimately, we should all be thinking about moving towards brand suitability, but most importantly, we want to leave you with some key takeaways from this session. There are six key questions to help you develop a playbook for this, for your brand. Number one, you need to understand your level of risk tolerance. Is it low risk tolerance or is it high risk tolerance? If you look at high risk tolerance, that includes whitelists, pricing is a factor, Scale is a factor. But once you've agreed where you lie on that risk continuum, at that point, you then need to actually balance your risk tolerance with scale. The second thing, identify both themes and topics, which are both positive and negative for your brand to make it very rich in the approach when you look at this from an exclusion point of view, as well as inclusion and driving those business outcomes. Three, Make sure you're aligning with quality sites and brands that actually match your values and objectives, and that's really important. Four, avoiding those huge keyword exclusion lists, moving away from that whole brand safety legacy and moving yourself up the ladder. Five is, excuse me, five is enriching and, and making your strategy a lot deeper. So what you can do, once you've identified both positive and negative keywords and themes, you can then start prioritizing those. And that's very cool because that really helps to, to drive a lot more relevance and business outcomes for you as well. And finally, you can also then start diversifying your data points. So it's not only about your contextual segments, how can you then overlay that with first party data, time and weather data signals? There's a great webinar coming up, which will be all about first party data and, and we'll obviously send that out ahead of time. But most imp importantly, when you've actually defined your brand suitability approach and you put all of those things into action, it's a, it's, this is a real combination that it has to be done across the ecosystem. It, it's done with a team, not just the publisher, but it's the publisher, ad tech and agencies working together for the brand. And that's really important. Brands don't need to worry about the technology because we have the tools. And this is where you can then get us to help and leverage the tools that we've got, as well as the experts that we've got as well. So hopefully that's given everybody a much better idea of the different levels of brand safety and where the market is at right now. Now we're gonna ask a couple of questions and we have actually received quite a few questions um, on this. So we're just gonna ask some of these questions now. 
One question has come in and we don't have time to answer all these questions and the rest of them will obviously complete this and send it to everyone after the session. The first question came in, I'm not sure what my company uses and we may not even have any targeting solutions. Can Media Corp advise us how we, what we can do with baseline protection minimally or do we have to work with an agency? Um, you don't have to work with an agency uh, because obviously we have the tools. If you have an agency, that's where we work in partnership with the agency. Um, and it's almost doing a brainstorming session with you. Again, going back to those key questions that we posed, understanding where you sit on that risk uh, factor, whether you're high risk, whether you're low risk, understanding the themes and topics that are both positive and negative. Um, and from there, we can put a strategy in place for you. You can either leverage our tech. If you have an agency, we work very closely with an agency to make sure that we're all aligned. And we, you know, we're obviously doing that across the ecosystem. So that was the first question. Um, there's another question here. What should my company do to move up the advertising ladder? Is it, and I think they're talking about the ladder, the different steps of brand safety. Is it purely on the company's part to decide how far we go? Or does it depend on what's available by the agency? Also, is the price difference different between each of the levels? And I think that's a fantastic question. If it isn't, why is it that most companies are still at the first level of advertising? So there's a couple of questions in this question, but I think they're all great questions. So, Tran, um, I want to I want to pass this one over to you because certainly kind of you know obviously you talked about the ladder, and you talked about the different levels. You know what are your thoughts on this, Trang? Hi. So to move up the advertising ladders, I think the easiest, the first step that that we should do is to to check whether uh, are you still at the uh, blacklisting or whitelisting um, level of of uh, brand safety. So let's say if you have a brand list of 3,000 keywords that you send to agency or you send to your uh, publisher to, to block, so that is definitely the base, uh, that is definitely the legacy and you should move away from that. Uh, then second, the secondly, uh, the, the next question is about whether the price difference between each level big. Uh, honestly, no. Um, it is just different technology that works uh, better in terms of providing brand suitability in a contextual meaning. So uh, the technology that we're providing to MediaCorp, we do not work on a huge site list of 3,000 keywords. Uh, every segment, we allow up to 200 keywords. And that is enough to tell uh, the, the reader, to tell the advertisers and the publisher what a, a single page is about. And it's enough for us to make that decision, whether you want to target or not. So uh, if, uh, if it isn't, why is that most companies are still at the first level of, of advertising? So I would speculate, first of all, maybe uh, you have not heard of brand suitability or any other contextual intelligent technology. So maybe this is the first time you hear about it and, and maybe you will want to consider moving towards it. Or secondly, um, if the company has been using other technology vendors who purely um, develop their technology around QR blacklist, they might want to, to resist uh, moving away from that and they want to insist that you know, brand safety a uh, cute blacklist is still the, the way to go. Um, so uh, there's a couple of things that, that we can uh, consider uh, around this topic. Thanks, Tran. Two more questions and then we're going to move on um, and we'll answer the rest. Um, how do you control our ads effectively? Do we have to monitor every single ad closely or can we leave it to the system to notify us? I'm going to hand this one over to you, Amy, um, from an ad tech point of view. Sure. So the first level of brand safety that I mentioned is actually completely handled on our side. So we maintain the articles that we believe are not suitable for anyone to be advertising in as being completely blocked. The second level where it becomes more specific to your brand um, is where we need to communicate and collaborate so that we can apply that at the campaign level to say, look, keep this away from environmental issues because this brand wants to stay away from them. Um, and then moving to brand suitability, that's another area where we'll collaborate and identify the relevant segments that you want those ads to appear with. So the first level, completely taken care of by us. Other levels, let's collaborate. 
Great. Thanks, Amy. Last one, and I think this is, this is a very good one because it, it is an issue in the industry. Impressions are already paid for and it's blocked, so it's wasted money anyway. Very true. And that's exactly what happened on the New York Times. And that is why um, the rudimentary keyword, you know, blacklists that, we, that are in place don't work. And that's why you need to move up to that brand suitability where you've got that inclusion and exclusion and you're using the right kind of technology to be able to enable you to do, to do both, to really understand the content on the page itself. I think that was a very key one. Trang, if you've got anything else to add on to that before we move on. Uh, yes, yeah, so um, I would think that the key uh, takeaway from, from this uh, brand suitability is that you should do everything pre on the pre bid level and not on the post bid blocking um, uh, technology. Because what it makes a uh, difference is that in the post bid blocking, you pay for the impression already. And it means that if the impression is not safe, uh, you will see um, a creative that is, to, that is created to block your actual creative. It means it's a wasted money. Um, if you use it pre bid, there's no creative being served. Uh, and you, you reserve that dollars for the actual a suitable and, and brand safe impression that you can serve. Thank you, Trang. Very good. Right. So now we want to move on. Um, we're finishing now, but we want to. We, we want the feedback from you. So if you don't mind taking a couple of seconds to complete this, uh, this webinar improved my understanding of the differences between brand safety versus brand suitability. Okay, thanks everybody. Um, thanks everybody for your feedback, appreciate it. Um, coming up next, before we leave, there's the, our next edition in our webinar series is on the 28th. It's about how to turn consumer behaviour into business success. We have two industry experts from Omnicom Media Group and Havas, who will be talking about the trends and insights necessary for brand vitality. There will be a whole bunch of case studies and examples around omnichannel uh, retail successes, which I'm very excited about. And it also talks about the opportunities for brands to respond to the crisis in a decisive manner, manner in the current environment. So keep an eye out for that. The invites will be coming out shortly. What I will say is thank you very much to everybody. Uh, there have been a couple of questions as to whether you're going to get a copy of the presentation after this. You will all get a recording of this on Friday. Um, we will also consolidate, because we've received quite a few questions, we'll consolidate all of those Q&As and also short share that with the audience. But for the time being, thank you everyone for joining. Most importantly, please stay safe and we look forward to seeing you soon. Have a great day.